it's Chris Luminati from Bro Bible, not about wrestling show, and I am here with the American Nightmare, Mr. Cody Rhodes. Cody, hey, what's going on, man? How are you? You doing all right? I'm doing good. I have to tell you something. Um, I'm not going to say my friend's name because I'll embarrass the hell out of him. You should. You should throw him under the bus. I, I should, but like literally two weeks ago, he texted me out of the blue, and he goes, "American Nightmare, I just got it." Like, <laughs> it, it's uh, it's funny. A lot of people still just kind of get it, and it was more along the lines of New Japan Pro Wrestling at the time wanted to. They like paying like homage and and doing things that kind of tread back on history, mm -hmm. but at the same time they also like really simple iconic mm -hmm. things. So yeah, a lot of people just get it uh now which is great they, they, they just put it together and and that's good too because there's a whole new generation who may not be familiar with dusty and the american dream so it's any anytime wrestling can be slightly educational or causes you to research it's not a bad thing but uh, what makes it funny is i mean he's my age we grew up watching your dad yeah and it's something that should be obvious to the average or to the fan that's been watching for 30 something years and then when it hits you like if, if I were him, I literally would not have admitted it. I would just sort of pretend I knew it from the beginning. Like, yeah, oh, I was you're right. Just let it, <laughs> just let it, the light bulb go off in your head and don't say anything. Yeah. So did you come up with the name or they came up with it first or how did it? Uh, I actually uh, came up with it myself when we were trying. It was really a small thing, but uh, they're in Japan. They don't, they have trouble pronouncing roads. Okay. They would say like Rodez, and okay. I, I thought that was really sweet and liked it. Uh, but it was something I wanted to do. I, I was really adamant about not doing anything that related to my dad uh, during um, his life. And when he, he passed away, in this weird way, it kind of freed up some of these things. I had done everything I could to build my own run and my own, you know, legacy, not to, you know, the degree he had built his, but it freed some of these things up and it just felt perfect because at the time I really do uh, kind of exude a very different individual than he was. He was absolutely the son of a plumber and incredibly blue collar and, and uh, very personable. And when people meet me, the, it doesn't bother me, but it's kind of all, it's like the opposite. I'm not very personable. Uh, I had at the time a jet black hair. I was kind of a dick to be honest, like it. And I was always a bad guy as a wrestler. Mm -hmm. So it just, it just worked. You know, that's what happens too. When you're the blue collar guy who makes all this great money in wrestling, you end up having a silver spoon kid uh, who's not at all. He doesn't <laughs> share the same, uh, a life experience as, as Dusty had. So it worked out perfectly for him to be the American dream and me to juxtapose it and be the American nightmare. Now, do you feel like, this happens to me often, uh, do you feel like people assume you're an asshole just because you're quiet? Like, is that what it is? Uh, no, I assume people think I'm an asshole because I am really honest. Okay. And that's because I'm very honest with myself too. My favorite trait in a wrestler, and it's something that I try to have the most of uh, mm. and be honest with myself, is self-awareness. Mm. Wrestling is filled because we walk that gray line, that, that middle road between fiction and reality. Mm. And wrestling is filled with people who are not self-aware. And that's part of being self-aware means being really honest with yourself that's where do the work comes from because it's a much more fair industry than people think but i'm very honest um and that does not make you a lot of friends and in a management position uh which i'm in now it you've got to be careful with how honest you are you know some people everyone's different some people do like a lot of uh firm hand and other people are all positive reinforcement types uh when i mjf is a prime example when you know he's no longer he's he's outgrown me and he's out of the nest but when he was just my little protege i was very mean and firm and it didn't work mm -hmm. and i think his sister of all people was the one who told me like yeah 
he doesn't work that way. He's a spoiled little kid from mm -hmm. Long Island. You got to tell him how good he's doing. Uh -huh. Then he'll start going, well, could I have done this better? You know? So, yeah, I think it's honesty that, that causes that uh, assumption that I'm, I'm not the friendliest. So do you think guys come to you more or less for advice because of your honesty? I think more. Okay. I think more. Uh, wrestling is, you know, filled with you come back through the curtain and – uh, great job and thumbs up and everyone's happy or it's almost an indifference. You kind of just go by the production table and no one says anything. Uh, it's, it's strange. And then you get together at the after party or if it was, you know, when I was with WWE and you'd get in a rental car and drive to the next city, that's where you get all of it out of you. You know, uh, what, well, what did you think of this? And was this terrible or was this great? And I think more, more people come to me because I'm honest, because we're a startup company, a giant startup company, but still a startup. Mm. And we don't do us any service just lying to each other or glad handing each other. The show has to be the best wrestling show ever, every week. Mm. And that's difficult if you're not telling people, Hey, here's, you know, here's something that I learned when I wrestled with this individual, here's something that you might want to try. And um, I, I like it though. A lot of, I like having people come to me and I, I try my best to, to give answers. So a lot of the other like interviews that I listen to with a lot of the older guys, they say that a lot of the business is lost because there's no more long car rides. Where yeah. Pick the brain of other people. Do you feel that you kind of juxtapose that by having guys around like Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, always in the back where guys might not be in a car, but they can pick their brain at any time. 100%. And that, if you're a wrestler and you don't realize why they're there, mm -hmm. uh, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, Medusa were all backstage this week. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the girls went and asked Medusa questions. Uh, FTR is always with Tully. Arn sits in my office for the most of the day and everything that comes out of his mouth mm. is, is genius. Mm. It, you, if you've made money in professional wrestling, if you've captivated the imagination of the audience for X amount of years and years and years, it's, there's no shame in going to them. It's like having the books with all the answers in them mm. in the library and, and you just, all you gotta do is go just go open the book. Just go check the book out. Right. Um, and not everyone does that, but they will. If they want to survive and endure, you really are a product of the people around you. And uh, Arn is a great example. Uh, there's, there's that to have a legend like that and have Tully. Uh, they're very helpful. Jake Roberts, too. I'll tell you a story that, uh, you know, I don't know if Chris cares, but Chris shares way too much information anyway. So I'll share a little Chris Jericho story. <laughs> he had he had a match with Orange Cassidy mm -hmm. and Chris has always been a bit trepidatious about wrestling in the pandemic era mm -hmm. uh, because there's no audience. His life is, you know, he's this master performer who's always had an audience. And he said that he, he was refusing to have a bad match that he was going to absolutely gut it out and have the performance of a lifetime because Jake Roberts mm -hmm. was in the crowd mm -hmm. and he could see him. And he said, there is no way I was going to even have anything less than excellent with Jake, who was just leaned forward, watching every second of it. Because our locker room fills up the crowd half the time right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, to have those guys around is very motivating for, for people like me and uh, other, uh, other wrestlers. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be kind of good that when there are no fans, that the people that are there, like yeah. – like with all that Chris Jericho's done that he's still trying to concentrate on one person standing in the corner who's yeah. like, you know, so that's like part of the motivation when there is nobody there. And I actually saw, um, you could probably verify if this is true or not, but I, I feel like I saw online the other day that you guys have done more shows now with no fans than you have with fans. Yep. I think we just crossed that threshold. Uh, oof, that's a scary now, when you started this whole thing, you never thought, you, like, no one ever thought to themselves, yeah, so the majority of the time we're going to be wrestling in front of the locker room. I, I could have never envisioned where we were. And even when the pandemic, we were in Salt Lake when we knew we were flying home. A lot of us had red eyes to the East Coast, and that's where everything was getting shut down, shut down, shut down. And we knew 
it was going to happen. I had thought, well, we're going to end up doing these closed set wrestling tapings. We're going to be putting on evergreen content like classic pay-per-views or Talk is Jericho live in the ring. Some great options. Mm. But Tony Khan had kind of the foresight to, oh, well, we can do studio tapings, but let's let's do them with the the, the boys and mm. the girls as the as the audience. I mean, we jokingly as a wrestler, we're, we're the biggest marks of all wrestlers. So right. we're a great audience uh, <laughs> for uh, for each other's matches. And it was very uh, smart of him. And he also was flanked by, you know, he's able to see what the NFL is doing mm. with COVID policy mm. and how seriously they're taking it. And what steps do you need to take to make sure you get everybody in one city, you get them all tested, you get them all safe, what steps you need to take and do that so you can put shows on without feeling guilt or without feeling like any way carny. And Doc Sampson, Dr. Michael Sampson and Tony Khan have uh, been wonderful. Uh, Mega two have been wonderful about doing these shows and doing them safely. That, that, that's great. I mean, it's, it's so hard, especially because like, you know, now we've kind of figured it out, but in the beginning, like, nobody knew what to do. <laughs> you know, no one ever dealt with something like this. No one, no one wanted to be the first one to try something should it fail. You know, like, oh, let's put maybe 20 people in a crowd. And if that yeah. were to go wrong. So it's really hard that you're starting from nothing. It's gotten a little bit easier. And you guys have done a lot of great things like with the stadium stampede and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> you guys have worked around it. But eventually I feel like you're gonna, like the, the canvas is starting to get smaller and smaller with what you can do, you know, as far as painting the picture. Yeah, and I, I think we're all hoping for the same thing is, okay, um, I feel like hopefully we're at the, in the winter of the pandemic, basically. Mm -hmm. I, we're at, at the end. There's a vaccine nearby. Saliva testing is uh, becoming more pro you know common now, it looks like, than the old brain scratcher, which I had to give myself yesterday. Yeah. Uh, uh, just wanted to, oh, so bad. <laughs> uh, but I think we're, we're feeling like we're near the end, and that – that would make me really happy to you got to do it slowly at first i thought oh well one day we'll just be able to snap our fingers and we can bring in thousands of people back but the reality is we've got to do it slowly we've got to do it at a distance uh it's no secret we field tested it last week with a friends and family group of about 300 mm -hmm. uh we're, we're doing everything we can uh to get ready for it but what, that's the thing, as, in, as an entertainer and someone in your, your shoes to, uh, doing these interviews and, and, and keeping the content fresh, mm -hmm. content king, and we've all, I feel like, challenged ourselves and stretched ourselves that we're better creators. Mm -hmm. We're better content deliverers now because we, we went through this pandemic mm -hmm. um, that we can tell our kids about as if it was the, you know, the Great Depression of our era. I'm going to make... Years from now, I'm going to make this thing seem like it lasted years and years and years. Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think we're at the end. And if we're not, we're prepared to, to pivot to keep the content coming. You know, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit selfish here. I, not that I think the virus is in any way good. But for a person like me, it's actually been a, better because I can get a Cody Rhodes on a video conference call and do an interview because you have a little bit more time because there's not the travel and stuff. Like, if we were trying to do this and you were in full AEW travel planning mode, like, I probably wouldn't have been able to get you to sit down for 20, 25 minutes. Especially, it's forced everybody to learn how to do Zoom. <laughs> you <Yeah. know? laughs> I, uh, I appreciate that. How do you – where do you right now kind of – I just told somebody, I hope I – I hope I finish Zoom throughout the pandemic, and then I hope I never see Zoom ever again. <laughs> but everything, like, I did um, I did a wardrobe fitting. I did a doctor. I did my own COVID test you know, uh, for an, a side project that I'm doing. Like, I did a doctor's Zoom. Mm -hmm. This is a very useful tool. There are some kind of uh, ancient pieces of production that are no longer needed. Yeah. Uh, like production meetings where you fly all these people in to sit in a room and yeah. argue over paper. We don't even need any of that. But, you know, we don't need to go paperless. We don't need to travel. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Zoom's part of our life now. It's part well, of our life. 
if it's shown you anything, maybe not in our businesses, but in most businesses, I feel like it shows people that a lot of the things they did during the day were pretty pointless. Like a lot of the meetings that they held, a lot of sure. the like, memos that went out, really. Well, I, I heard this once and I, it always stuck in my head. And it's basically, whenever you go and try and find a job, you are applying for a job because the person above you doesn't want to do something anymore for their job. Sure. Making another job for somebody else. So every time I think of that, I'm like, yeah, so we probably eliminated so many things that we don't have to do anymore. You know? Yeah. I, you, I think you cut the, if anything, from a production standpoint, a lot of fat's been cut. Mm. If, and so you mentioned memos and yeah. meetings, meetings, yeah. uh, it, it, a lot of fat's been cut. Really, all that matters is the, the, the specific content delivery itself. Mm. So yeah, but see, that scares me because I'm a big delegator. Uh -huh. I'm, a big, I'm a big meetings about meetings, a big memo guy. Um, but uh, I'll have to adjust like everybody else or I'll be passed by. My, uh, my assistant is literally on the other side of this door huh. and he does way more work than I do. <laughs> Go ahead, like, he does way more. He's walked by a few times. I don't genuinely want him to hear me, but I'm happy for him. He is <laughs> happy to do whatever the world needs him to, because I was a big, you know, delegator, but hey. But that's <laughs> different. You're not, assistants are needed. Like, some people aren't really needed. So, <laughs> yeah, they're needed. And then yeah, I think um, it's been really helpful for me because – all that stuff was offered to us as far as the, the management roles. And I was really adamant about if you, if you give me a management role, uh, it's not going to be um, namesake or a, a figurehead thing. I really will want to do the work. Um, so to have resources uh, like Tony was able to provide us at AEW uh, has made it so that I can wrestle without feeling distracted. Um, there's someone there to pick up the pieces for when I get into wrestling mode. Um, and that's been a really, you know, just wonderful. And it actually frees up in my mind, how much stuff can I do? Mm -hmm. What can I do with it when it becomes too much? Can I do this acting class on the side, uh, to perform, you know, for, to better my performance? Um, can, can I train, but at a high level, because I'm a big proponent in drug-free athletics, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, entertainment, it's, it's too easy to find drugs for entertainment, you know, and performance enhancing drugs. And I'm a big proponent of clean living because I want to live as well as perform. So to be able to train at that level at 35, you've got to do that. And then to be able to, to manage and produce other people's segments that aren't mine, you got to be able to do that. Um, so very helpful to me. Cool. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, too. Um, yeah. Tattoo. Yeah, there. I love it because as like I got a ton. Look, I have New Jersey on me, so oh, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I like the I know I know a lot of people. There's a lot of like people love it, people hate it. You obviously love it. My question is, why the neck? Oh, it's a really good question. Um, selfishly, I, I wanted to look at what I was doing. I, I have, it sounds silly, but I have big plans for myself. You know, I, I'm, I'm real confident that I'm, I'm going to try and continue to climb this ladder as a wrestler mm -hmm. and to, to branch out into new worlds. And I didn't want to hide it. Okay. And I was looking at uh, Conor McGregor and I was looking at the rock to just marquee box office absolute i mean the rock is 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 box office now and conor mcgregor as far as combat sports and i looked at conor's chest and i looked at rock's brahma bull and i just something about it was inspiring in a sense that if i did do the the nightmare family logo which is on all my stuff already whether it be my boots my bags everything the the team jackets i wanted it to be seen uh and i just thought the neck was the perfect spot <laughs> It, it's I love the design and I had the guy who did it it looks exactly like he showed me other than the fact that it's a hair bigger than I <laughs> thought it was gonna be okay uh and that's um you know you see people in like the gas station and such who have no clue about wrestling or anything of that nature and they look at that and it's always a, 
a weird moment. You don't know what they're thinking. It's a very patriotic symbol. And this is mm. a this is a tough time to appear as a patriotic person, or yeah. if you are, as I feel like I'm a genuinely very patriotic person. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no, I I love the tat. It's kind of because the internet had such a reaction to it. I think certain people are feel real like free to take shots at me at work with it a lot. And man, I don't think they see my face. Every time they do, I'm always like, <laughs> guys, I like the tattoo. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I don't share the general consensus because it's like uh, you you know this because you're you've got your finger on the pulse. Everything you do on Instagram is positive and great and everyone loves it. Mm -hmm. Everything you do on Twitter mm -hmm. is the worst thing that's ever been done. You're killing the industry. You've destroyed blood. So really, I, I, I'm on an Instagram reaction to the tattoo when a lot of people are on their Twitter you know, feed on it. You know, Hey, it was polarizing. Was something to talk about. Well, let, let me give you a little hint as a guy who works in the internet. Yeah. There are many people who, so say Cody gets a neck tattoo they'll go and see the reaction and whatever the majority reaction is, they're going to go against it. Of course. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> so they're going to take the opposite side, whether they agree with it or not. Yeah. And that's just how it works. And uh, beautiful thing. Yeah. That's just, that's just it. So um, t uh, two questions. One, did it hurt? Mm -hmm. And two, does it make you want to get more? So it hurt a lot. Uh, <laughs> I, it hurt a lot, and I was trying to kind of be tough throughout. Mm. So I just waited, and finally the guy, he said, you know, you can take a break if you want. And I was, oh, great. And then I have, and when I took the break, it was almost completely done at that point. Okay. And I thought, oh, I did really well. Like, I, <laughs> I did really well for this. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was real, like, um, not like the worst pain, but real jarring, real, like, teeth – grinding pain mm -hmm. because it's right there on that vein and even yeah. when you like touch it now i can still it's like a phantom pain yeah i can still kind of feel it a little bit so it did hurt uh and then what was the second question does it make you want more no no more no no i uh i want because everyone's like oh you got to connect it to something you gotta yeah. you gotta do this like nah i'm good like that was it if i if i got another tattoo i'd probably get pharaoh my dog okay somewhere. No, he's in here too. Pharaoh, come here. You gonna say hi? You gonna say hi? Sorry, he's had to come to work today because it's okay. Hey, Pharaoh. Hey. Hi. Yeah. Who, who who paces outside more, your assistant or the dog? Oh, so Pharaoh is on the mend. He's got a torn ACL. Oh no. So, yeah, he's just laying here. Oh, uh, no. be, yeah, he's. A, he, I don't know. I didn't even know dogs had ACLs. Oh. So yeah. how did how did he do that? We think he's got an ongoing feud with a neighbor dog where they run up and down the fence. Ooh. We think that the Pepper, the neighbor dog, finally just out, out sprinted him. But he's a husky, so he doesn't let you know he's hurt. He's ah. just walking around on three legs. Um, and then we saw he's, he's got hurt. But he's going to be okay. He'll be so fine. He's, so he's more the baby face in this. He's, the, he's not going to be. He's kind of oh, like. Oh, that, <laughs> that, that other dog's a heel piece of shit. That, I'm sorry. I don't. I, that dog. I like all dogs. I've tried several times to slip treats through the fence. Huh. His pepper, and he's a total. He's a total heel, and he doesn't listen to his family. They always try to get him, and it looks like a whole calamity. Well, I've never spoken to the family at all. Uh, but Brandy's starting to. She's at her wits' end with with Pepper. I like all dogs though, uh -huh. so I don't miss him if he wasn't there because he's like the heel in Pharaoh's journey. You know. Yeah. You know. You know. If you were gonna say to me, I met a dog named Pepper. I'm just gonna assume heel. Like, that just sounds like a heel name. <laughs> yeah, he's a street dog. You know what I'm saying? He's a street <laughs> dog. Yeah. Um, so that leads us – that actually leads us to something I want to talk about, too, promos. And uh, real quick, I want to talk about your promos. And then hopefully this works. Sure. Um, I, I have three audio clips that I want to play from you for you yeah. of old promos. Hopefully you can hear the audio. But first, I want to talk about your promos. Uh, do you tend to – because I, I like them. They all seem real to me. Do you tend to like kind of map them out in your head and then speak off the cuff or do you kind of have like, how does that work? So the secret to all everything in a wrestling promo, all the classic great wrestling promos, mm -hmm. never believe anyone if they say, oh, I just was going off the cuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't write them down. 
maybe they didn't rehearse them, but they definitely did them in their car, uh, in the in the mirror. They definitely did them at the gym when you see these wrestlers walking around muttering to themselves. Uh, they definitely did work on them a great deal. I work on mine to the same level. I, I, I hold my standard to the same standard that you would hold a monologue on a TV show. Um, it's field tested, it's reworked, it's voice memoed, it's listened to, it's sent out to the people I trust. I spend, if I know I'm gonna have a rest, an interview, mm -hmm. I spend every day between shows working on, on that interview. So I'm a big, uh, like I said, memo and meetings about meetings. I'm a big, uh, big preparation guy. What I found is when you know the material well enough, you give yourself license to forget it. And that's where magic comes up. Because in every interview I've ever done with Tony Schiavone in the ring, what I plan to say deviates mm -hmm. because there's magic and you cannot replicate the magic of having a live crowd and a live crowd's going to take you on a different route too. So that's why it's really good to know your material. You can give yourself license to forget it and then find it again, almost organically. I know that sounds really like, methody and whatnot but that's how i was how i was trained and that's how i prefer to do it it works i mean it works yeah. um so uh the three clips i'm gonna play for you hopefully you can hear them so there's a, a hashtag that i definitely want you to check out on um instagram it's called mike slip monday sure and it's basically old wrestling clips of guys I think, like, I, i've seen mike slip monday i know okay. what you're talking all right, so I'm going to play three for you, and I want you to try and tell me how you would recover from sure. these three. Uh, hopefully, you can hear this. So let, let's just try first. See this? Can you, hear, can you hear that? I can hear it. Okay. So this is uh, Sid Vicious, and he's cutting a promo on Hall and Nash. So hold on one second. Uh, I just want to refresh it again. Okay, here we go. See Nash used to wear Gigi Howard costume you want to but you know and I know that you're only half the man that I am and I have half the brain that you do <laughs> now okay first question if someone's cutting a promo on you and they just tell you that they have half the brain that you do yeah. do you let them continue or do you stop them <laughs> So I have kind of this weird, this, this is really like business of the business, maybe a little too inside baseball, but it is. I love uh, inside baseball, so go for it. It is a thought of, of promos. If you know who's winning mm -hmm. in the end, mm -hmm. you should always be cognizant of that. For example, if you feel like you're not winning this piece of business in the end, mm -hmm. then go ahead and go for the jugular. Finish. If you are, mm -hmm. do everything you can to set them up, mm -hmm. protect them. In the case of what happened with Sid and the half the, you know, half the man, half the brain, he, it's only one slip that really changes where he was wanting to go. Yeah. As someone like Sid who looked like, him, looked like he did, all you gotta do is throw the heat on yourself. Mm -hmm. That's it. All you gotta do is throw the heat on yourself. And as a, if you're Sid in that moment, and you know what's just happened, it's real simple. Say, hey, you know, I just said, yeah, I had half the brain, and obviously I'm, I'm not the, the smartest uh, guy out here, but I, I certainly think I'm the best in the ring. So, Scott, why don't you come to the ring and we stop this war of words? You won that. Why mm -hmm. don't you come to the ring and we finish it here? That way you set him up, mm -hmm. not come into the ring, and not get yourself booed out of the building, and not leave on such an awkward note. Anytime you put the heat on yourself, it's way better. It's endearing. You know, my dad would tell you to look down or look up and laugh if you ever get lost. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, you were dealing though with Scott Hall, who's one of the most famous kind of put the screws to you in that right. moment. Yeah. Uh, but that's what Sid, Sid should have called him to the ring. And I don't know if that's even what happened after. We only remember that terrible yeah. slip. But yeah, just do the old panic the old panic, just like when we're kids and we're someone's getting the best of us, just turn it into a fight. Turn it into a fight. Best thing you can do. All right, here's number two. Here's Lex Luger talking to Hollywood Hogan. Classic. Hey boys, I am sick and tired of playing around with kids. I'm here 
and get on with the big boys. I am. Okay, so Lex is tired of playing with kids. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you think that's bad, wait till we get to the last one. The last I, know, one. I have a feeling I know what the last one's going to be. Okay. Um, I'm regular these type of promos. Okay. So his promo walked a inappropriate line without realizing it was inappropriate. Yeah. A awkward mm -hmm. word. Actually, Jake Hager, who I, I, I Jake is a unique soul. We we came up through OVW together. I'd never forgot. He one time cut a, a promo on two guys where he said, "I've got a surprise for you two little girls." <laughs> uh, but the way he said it was, he said, "I got a surprise for you." Little girls it was uh, you expected like a troop of Girl Scout cookies to you know Girl Scouts to run out and start beating these other guys up. It's phrasing and how we word things is very tricky. Um, that is an unsavable promo. <laughs> that is uh, the best thing you can do in that case is the bad guy or in this case Hulk Hogan uh, should have just started beating him up. Uh, <laughs> then people maybe feel feel you know feel bad for you and then want you to cheer you up but that is unsavable there even even who i feel like i'm a master of the interview like that is no there there's nothing you can do to come back from that uh i'm trying to really scratch in the time it would take to come up with a proper mm -hmm. concise response this segment would have been over so <laughs> he's screwed do, all right so do you want to take a guess on the last one is it Magnum TA talking about, <laughs> talking about yep, I know. It's, I asked Tony Schiavone about it all the time because Tony Schiavone threw the interview from the studio to Magnum remote. Right. And I asked Arn about it all the time because Arn was there and Arn takes a flat back bump on the like carpet but cement locker room floor and Oli doesn't go down. And it's mm -hmm. always funny to me how Arn did that. But – I know the interview. If you want to play it, we are. Th are we talking about the same one? Play it. Let me. Let me see. I think we uh, are. Okay. All right. Here we go. And Tully Blanchard, you can't run and hide from me anymore. Yeah. When we come to Philadelphia this time, there's going to be no mistaking what's going to happen. I'm going to come on you like nobody's ever come on <laughs> you before. No baby doll at your side. Nobody to run distraction for you. Just you and I getting it on like two men should do. This is a. <laughs> It goes and, and it gets he's like why the he even says professional wrestling where the boys sit on the side and watch <laughs> in the same interview. Um, so So there's more to that? So he he it's it gets it doesn't get as bad as that initial moment, okay. <laughs> but it, it stays pretty bad. And then the, the then he then he gets they run in the locker room and he fights off Arn, but only okay. down. Because they didn't get as many take takes at it, okay. And you got to be careful in wrestling. If you're doing an interview and someone's gonna beat you up, or if there's a big moment, you can't get to the big moment if you screwed up. Because once there's a black eye or a scuff or your shirt's ripped, you can't redo it. Yeah, you can't redo it. Yeah. And that is what happened in that very famous, <laughs> uniquely sexually a very sexual promo. That's what happened. They, they rip his shirt off. They beat him half to death. There's no way he could redo it. Okay. And that was back in the era of, and I'm pretty sure my dad may be responsible for this, the guys used to just rib each other on air. Yeah. So th that's a rib of a promo that lives forever. Here's, okay, the promo today is wild yeah. when you hear it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, though? Yeah. There, the story, the real life drama between Magnum and Tully was so genuine, and they had the audience like in the palm of their hands. Mm -hmm. The people did the classic; they forgave it. They didn't hear it like we hear it now. Yeah, that's what saved that promo. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were so invested in Magnum as a hero, yeah. so wanting to see Tully get beat. But it is a it is a regular listen for me. I, I mean. Put it Oh, it's a regular <laughs> listen. I've listened to it three times, four times just today, and I'm crying laughing every time. Yeah, I mean, it. I mean, there's some heavy hidden lines in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you got to ask yourself, you don't want to blame Magnum. Whoever was filming it, mm -hmm. whoever it was, should have said, hey, <laughs> guys, this sounds a little strange. 
you sound like you're trying to bite him in Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. But hey, lesson learned, you know. Well, I actually, um, I want to wrap this up because my Zoom is giving me the three minute warning that I only have three minutes left. On sure. The- so real quick, let's go over. I know some of the schedules got kind of screwy with the NBA playoffs with the shows. So let's go over that real quick so people remember. Yeah. Where did- so the big one is that there is no Dynamite, you know, Wednesday this week. The Dynamite will be uh, Saturday the 22nd, this Saturday at 6 Eastern. So we're two hours early and we're on a Saturday, which I love because I, I grew up watching wrestling and watched a lot of it on Saturdays um, following the NBA playoffs game. So a great opportunity if you've never jumped on board with us uh, to jump on board, plus a massive, you know, TNT title match and a great card. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, that's a big change. And I'm terrible at my job because that's the only change I'm fully aware of. However, it's a sweet graphic that – that I've seen it all over. I'll throw – I'll plaster it right in here so that everybody knows. Thank you very much. Cody, I had a great time talking to you. I wish you the best of luck with everything. And, uh, you know, hopefully this whole I, – I don't know if COVID ever goes away, but hopefully, you know, AEW gets to be in front of fans real soon. I hope so. And next time, let's talk about Zelda. I had all these Zelda No, facts. I'm sorry, man. Yeah. Uh, you know what? We got off into a track. We will definitely do this again. Tell me real quick something about Zelda. <laughs> My favorite weapon ever in Zelda is the long shot. Okay. That's a – question i get asked what's your favorite zelda weapon and it was always the long shot because you know in the ocarina of time when you can't like get anywhere and you but you see the target you see the bullseye Uh so long shot it opened up a world for me so there you go there there's next time we'll definitely talk about it heck yeah